The Louisiana Mafia was one of the oldest Mafia families in America. It had learnt a lot of painful lessons. In New York, if you ever broke the law, you were prosecuted and then sent to jail. If you had committed multiple offences, especially if they were serious, it got you the electric chair. On occasion, corruption helped a lot of powerful men get away with prosecutions. The same could be said for Louisiana. However, in 1891, there was a lot of public uproar regarding corruption and what was happening regarding an Italian gangland war. A police officer called Chief Hennessy had been shot dead, and the local Louisianians blamed the Italian community, especially the Italian Black Hand. A corrupted judge helped the men beat the trial. However, the public was not so forgiving. They gathered en masse and stormed the jailhouse where the men were being kept and went on to commit mass murder. They hung eleven innocent men, all of whom were of Italian background. The Louisiana Mafia learnt from this lesson all the way back in the year of 1891. They learned never go public with your crimes, your families, or your people. It's always behind closed doors. They themselves would go deeply underground and forever hide themselves in the shadows. They would even conduct their meetings deep in the remoteness of the bayous. Coming into the thirties, this mafia controlled most of what went on in the state of Louisiana. They also controlled the politics, especially the Huey Long family. A powerhouse was slowly being born. Silver Dollar Sam went on to be deported in around the forties. Out of all the crime family members that he had in his family, he knew one member was the one that was going to lead the outfit for the foreseeable future. His name was Carlos Marcello. Boss of the Marcello family, his wife was Jacqueline Todaro. The Todaro family were the underboss family of the Silver Dollar Sam faction. If you ever Google pictures of Carlos Marcello, you would always see two people around him. One was his wife Jacqueline, and the other person was his lawyer Michael Maroon. He also had the big powerhouse lawyers such as Jack Wasserman and Irving Davidson. The public officials of Louisiana knew not to tangle with the Marcello family. They did not want to dredge up bad memories of the past. So certain officials were always wary of mentioning a mafia, especially in Louisiana. This allowed the Silver Dollar Sam faction, as well as the Carlos Marcello faction, to grow quietly but rapidly. Coming into the thirties, they practically controlled the entire state of Louisiana with an iron fist. While New York's public knew who its gangsters were, such as Luciano, Dutch Schultz, Lepke, Frank Costello, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, and more. The vice and prostitution trial of Charlie Luciano made Charlie famous for all the wrong reasons. The Time magazine article, a previous video I made, made Frank Costello famous. Of course, we all know Al Capone, the most famous mobster to ever live. The death of Benjamin Siegel made his name front-page news, Vito was in the papers, Adonis was being deported. However, the Louisiana Mafia was virtually unknown, yet they were the oldest Mafia in America. The South knew it had crime. They knew they had gangsters. They had some of the most famous, however. They assumed there were people like Bonnie and Clyde. Outlaws, rather than a Mafia. Coming into the thirties, New York was investing hundreds of millions into Louisiana. It became a gold mine. Frank Costello said about Louisiana, it was the best investment I ever made in my life. The New York Mafia started with Louisiana and then spreads outwards. By the 40s, they created the Carlos Marcello Syndicate. By 1943, Benjamin Siegel got permission from Costello and Luciano to build a casino in the state of Nevada in the desert. By the mid-40s, the South had casinos everywhere. The South was money laundering more money for the Mafia than New York and Chicago combined. Maya turned it into the capital for corruption, murder, vice, and more. The French Corsican Mafia, Cuban Mafia, Irish Mafia, Vietnamese, and other Asian players who were huge in narcotics, Mexican Mafia, as well as the New York Mafia, Chicago, and more all got together or sent representatives to New Orleans to get business done. New Orleans was infamous for pretty much everything it was thriving and suffering at the same time. Then we got Galveston, Texas. The Maceo family made so much money from political corruption, extortion, legitimate business, narcotics, money laundering, gambling, and more. They made such a fortune that they went legit and moved into Vegas in the fifties. However, they put up another front family named the Fertitta crime family. Both families had decades of corruption, murder, and more backing them. 
In the 50s, the Campisi and the Civello family were sent to Dallas by Marcello to help corner the rackets, the same time as Ruby and Chicago goons were sent up there. In the 50s, a deal was made between New Orleans and Chicago that they would share Texas. Some families were independent, most answered to New Orleans or Chicago. I have seen a lot of posts stating Carlos Marcello was the most powerful mob boss in America honestly an organized crime at the top. No one man can be king alone. In the Italian-American mafia these men ruled together, helped each other, and conquered it all together. They were powerful as a syndicate, not as one boss. Today I am going to talk to you about Carlos Marcello. Carlos Marcello was sitting on top of the world at this moment in time. However, he was still at war with the Washington establishment. They were going after him in various ways. One enemy was dead, and his name was John F. Kennedy. Another two had died in 1968. Their names were Robert F. Kennedy, and the other was Martin Luther King. Two years after those assassinations, this article then comes out in regards to Marcello and his political power in Louisiana. Two magazines came out in 1967. One came out on September 1st, and the other came out September 8th. The one that came out September 8th I will give to you in the future. The one on September 8th highlighted Marcello's relationship with Jim Garrison and his political relationship with various families across Louisiana, and the reason that is so interesting is because in 1991 Marcello was free and living in the South. A famous movie will then come out and be all over Hollywood. That movie was JFK, the movie directed by Oliver Stone. That movie was all about Jim Garrison and his investigations into the Kennedy assassinations. I can assure you that that investigation carried out by Jim Garrison was an investigation carried out for Marcello. It was what we call a fishing expedition. To find out any witnesses that can link the assassinations back to Marcello. If you look at the situation, that's exactly what happened. Anyone who could link David Ferry, Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby or Bannister back to Marcello was assassinated. Jim Garrison started his investigations in 1966, in around the same time Marcello was arrested, La Stella restaurant with Santo Traficante, Carlo Gambino, Mike Miranda, Tommy Eboli, Colombo, and more. Marcello could no longer deny he was not part of the Mafia. When Marcello returned to New Orleans airport, he was verbally attacked by an FBI agent. Marcello reacted, and he punched the FBI agent in the face twice which made Marcello even more famous. People were now talking more than ever, not just about a mafia in New Orleans, but the mafia assassinating Kennedy. Witnesses were coming forward stating publicly that their testimony had been changed. Garrison immediately started his private investigation into the Kennedy assassination. While his investigations were happening, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and then a few weeks later, Robert F. Kennedy was killed. Garrison, after watching the witnesses who linked Marcello back to these crimes get killed, quickly got the message and wrapped up the investigations. Garrison worked for Marcello. Marcello laughed when he saw posters advertising Oliver Stone's JFK movie. He knew at that moment, and even around the late 80s when he heard about the movie being filmed in New Orleans, that he had gotten away with clipping his main nemesis. He finally felt safe knowing that the American public would never find out what happened to JFK, MLK and RFK. That was in 1991. Imagine the American people in the 70s when this magazine came out exposing Garrison as a Marcello lackey. Jim Garrison stated in the 60s and 70s that organized crime did not exist in Louisiana, and he also stated that Marcello was his good friend as well as a simple tomato salesman. Jim went on to say Marcello was not a mafiosi. Marcello knew at the moment nothing could touch him, and what happens when law enforcement can't stop you? What happens when the local government can't stop you? What happens when Washington can't touch you? What happens when you actually manage to assassinate a president? The same president you help get into the White House, and there are no repercussions. What happens when all the Senate committees come to the conclusion that your people are so powerful that they are like an invisible government controlling everything? The committee hearings introduce laws, but none of those laws are implemented in regards to touching you. What happens when all the public pressure is turning against you, yet no one still can do nothing against you? What happens when FBI agents know you have corrupted the man who helped create the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover himself? Well, that was the situation a lot of Americans found themselves in around this time. 
Jack F. Kennedy was assassinated in the year of 1963, and around 1967 and later some people around this time concluded that organized crime may have had a hand to play in it. The FBI knew these people were so powerful and had existed for so long that they themselves could do nothing. So a select few FBI agents walked out on the FBI and joined powerful magazines like Life magazine and Time magazine. They then started to leak stories that embarrassed the entire establishment so much they had to do something and act. The magazines were literally exposing billion-dollar frauds. They were exposing large frauds regarding political corruption, the Las Vegas skin, and the Teamster pension fund. There were certain secretive FBI agents that had one man in particular that they wanted to target a man that J. Edgar Hoover himself feared. His name was Carlos Marcello. Life magazine first hit him in 1967 with a one-page article, which was like a warning shot. It highlighted the situation between Jimmy Hoffa and his $2 million bailout fund. Hoffa was sitting in jail, and the Mafia had handed Marcelo a $2 million fund in regard to getting Hoffa out of jail by using whatever political corruption he had, which was basically LBJ in the White House. The 1970 Life magazine goes like this. In September 1967, after three Life articles described mob domination of politics and commerce in Louisiana, Governor John McEthan led a delegation of prominent Louisianians to New York to confer with Life's editors and writers. Returning home, he went on TV and told his audience what he had said to Life. Gentlemen, I want to first apologize to you for having said that you smeared our state. I want to say that you have not smeared us nearly as badly as you could have. As a matter of fact, you've been awfully kind to me and Louisiana in not having said anything more than you have. You have given us evidence here that we can go back to Louisiana with and clean up our state, and we think, put some people in the penitentiary. We can't wait to get back to Louisiana and start to do it. McKithen urged life. I want you all to come back and see us when we're looking better. He then ordered a series of investigations, which lasted approximately through the gubernatorial campaign of 1968, in which he was re-elected. Here, two years later, is life's report on Louisiana today. In 1967, when Life began a series of stories dealing with the grip of organized crime on the United States, we cited as a classic example how one powerful mob chieftain, Carlos Marcello, controlled the state of Louisiana. He did so, we reported, with little interference from local public officials or police, and indeed often with their help. Today the actions of the mob in Louisiana are more flagrant than ever. Marcello, now sixty, not only continues to dominate the state, but grows vastly richer each year at public expense. The key state officials he is known to have dealt with are still in office, some have even been promoted. Not only has Marcello managed to avoid paying state taxes on his widespread operations, but he has also found an ingenious way to use public funds to turn his $1 million investment in a Louisiana swamp into a real estate bonanza worth $60 million. Marcello does have troubles with the federal government and with envious fellow chieftains within the Cosa Nostra. But in Louisiana, the five-foot, one-inch Marcello, known as the Little Man, is more than ever the unchallenged giant of organized crime and of the state itself. People who cross the Little Man still get killed. In 1967, for example, Harry Bennett, a Marcello syndicate gambler, was gunned down 13 hours after he was seen approaching a federal prosecutor with an offer to testify against the boss. Last fall, Donald, Jimmy James, who had been Bennett's partner in a Gulf Coast gambling casino, also ran afoul of Marcello. James's sin was to swindle a Marcello gang member out of $10,000. When he learned of it, Marcello found James and got the money back. In January, James was found shot to death in almost the exact spot where Bennett had been killed two years earlier. Such terror tactics help sustain Marcello's reign. But the real obstacle to any honest attempt to dislodge him is the scores of Louisianians who are lined up to do him favors and to receive his favors in return. Many of these people occupy influential positions in state and local government. Governor McEthan at first delegated the investigation of mob influence in his administration to a commission headed by attorney Camille Gravel. But no sooner had Gravel focused his attentions on Marcello's good friend, C.H. Sammy Downs, the most powerful man in the McEthan administration, then the probe was halted, 
and Gravel resigned in disgust to return to private practice. At the time of the original Life articles, Downs was temporarily on loan to the presidential campaign staff of George Wallace, but he kept a suite of offices in the capital and maintained his contacts with Marcello. McKeithen later acknowledged this, while insisting that Downs was the only mafia link I know of in my administration. Yet when Downs returned from the Wallace campaign, McKeithen not only took him back, but named him as his executive counsel. Last August, the governor appointed Downs director of the heavily budgeted State Public Works Department. Following the resignation of Commission Chairman Gravel, the burden of the investigation fell to District Attorney Sergeant Pitcher, whose East Baton Rouge jurisdiction included the capital and most of the state offices. Pitcher's office conducted an eight-month search before concluding that there was no evidence of a link between Rackett's figure Carlos Marcello and the state capital. Meanwhile, the State Ethics Commission, working under the guidance of W.W. McDougall from Governor McKeithen's office, looked into life's disclosures concerning the relationship between Marcello and a state police captain named Roland Coppola. The commission ruled that Coppola's solicitation of Marcello for $42,000 in loans and the fact that organized gambling flourished in his parish were not incriminating. Coppola was suspended for 30 days, however, for accepting gratuities. Among the gratuities, though not specified in the commission's finding, were oil well royalties which have netted Coppola more than $30,000. Captain Coppola is still active in a headquarters job with the state police. McKeithen also issued special executive funds to Attorney General Jack Gramillion for the purpose of investigating organized crime. Gramillion came up empty-handed. Indeed, he had troubles enough defending his own involvement with a savings and loan company. The company Louisiana Loan and Thrift had been organized in 1966 by Gramillion and other attorneys. Over a period of 21 months, LL&T took some 2.6 million deposited by small investors and turned it over in the form of loans to politicians and Marcello-connected companies. In 1968, the company went into federal receivership, and auditors found that Gramillion, who had written several legal opinions which successfully removed LLT from federal supervision, had received $10,000 in legal fees from the firm and another $200,000 in loans. Gramillion, still Attorney General, has been indicted by a federal grand jury for his part in LLT's activities. The depositors, meanwhile, are still waiting to get their money back. In New Orleans, District Attorney Jim Garrison directed a succession of grand jury inquiries, each of which wound up in solemn agreement with Garrison that there was no evidence of organized crime in Orleans Parish. But meanwhile, enforcement agencies outside the state had arrested three of the nation's leading layoff bookmakers, Sam Di Piazza, Eugene Nolan, and Frank Timphony, for operating right in Garrison's jurisdiction. Garrison chose to ignore evidence given at the Di Piazza and Nolan trials that they were handling hundreds of millions of dollars in layoff bets from New Orleans. Both men were convicted. Timphony's trial is pending. From 1965 through 1969, Garrison obtained just two convictions and five guilty pleas in police cases brought against Marcello's gangsters. He elected not to prosecute 84 such cases, including 22 gambling charges one for attempted murder, three for kidnapping, and one for manslaughter. Garrison even managed to hush up the fact that last June, a Marcello bagman, Vic Corona, died after suffering a heart attack during a political meeting held in Garrison's own home. In Marcello's home territory of Jefferson Parish, which abuts New Orleans, District Attorney Frank Langridge, whose office is habitually deferential to Carlos Marcello, joined the chorus by ordering a perfunctory investigation and then declaring his district clean. Langridge and Marcello continue to share the services of an old mob enforcer named Joseph Zip Cimento, who is on the DA's staff as an investigator and works for Marcello as a collector for mob vending machines. In addition to Sammy Downs, Life has found a number of other officials with Marcello connections, notably Tom Ashey, a bookie from Lafayette, was and is a state racing commissioner. Marshall Brown, who acknowledges his friendship with Marcello and frequently makes business calls from Marcello's private phones, was and is the Democratic National Committeeman for Louisiana. Brown is also McKeithen's patronage chief for New Orleans and a member of the State Board of Education. Leon Gary, the McKeithen appointed director of the State Highway Commission, is the man to see whenever a state legislator, 
wants to line up free accommodations in Las Vegas. He arranges the hospitality through Marcello's personal man in Vegas, Mario Marino. Former Governor Jimmy Davis, who often helped Marcello during his two previous terms in office, is considered a strong bet to win back the governorship in 1972, when McIthan will be unable to run again under Louisiana law. Last September, police broke up what they described as a syndicate gambling operation at the Royal Coach Inn in Houston, Texas. Among the persons arrested were two Louisianians. One was a Marcello mobster named Frank Caracci. The other was a wealthy Baton Rouge electrical contractor and prominent political and sports figure named Frank Tiki. Sire. Sire, a close friend of both Governor McKeithen and U.S. Senator Russell Long, is a member of the State Licensing Board for Contractors and was until recently, under Long's patronage, a regional advisor for the Federal Small Business Administration. In 1968, he was named Louisiana's Outstanding Small Businessman. The SBA has been particularly helpful to Marcello Enterprises. In 1968 and 1969, it approved $883,000 in loans to Marcello-connected businesses. At the time of the Houston raid, police found a sizable number of bet slips and records on Sire himself. Phone records obtained by police for the days prior to the raid showed a striking split in traffic between calls to professional gambling and Cosa Nostra figures from coast to coast, and calls to political and sports figures known to be personal friends of Tiki Sire. Among the latter were calls to former Governor Davis, National Committee Man Brown, Victor Bussey, Louisiana FLCO President, State School Superintendent Bill Dodd, State Racing Commission Chairman L.A. Holland, Highway Department Director Gary, Senator Long, District Attorney Pitcher, U.S. District Judge Gordon West, Senator Long's former law partner, and Baton Rouge Sheriff Brian Clemens. A high-ranking Louisiana state police officer speedily arranged for Sire and Karachi to be bonded out of jail in Houston, and their case was eventually dismissed on grounds that an improper search warrant had been used. But the arrests and the seizure of the betting and phone records so alarmed Marcello that he abruptly shut down his statewide gambling operations. They were not reopened until late October, when, after exchanges between emissaries from New Orleans and Las Vegas, new codes and a new phone network were established. The case of Tiki Sire personifies the nonchalance of Louisiana politicians toward associations with organized crime. If they see any impropriety in Sire's joint connections to, say, Russell Long and Carlos Marcello, they tend to shrug it off as an acceptable expediency. Two generations of the Long family have coexisted with the Mafia in Louisiana. In 1934, Russell Long's father, the late Huey Long, invited New York mob boss Frank Costello to come into Louisiana and organize gambling for a percentage of the take. Costello later testified it was the most profitable investment he ever made. As Carlos Marcello grew to power in the Mafia, he was in frequent contact with a parade of other leading political figures notably Russell's uncle, Earl Long. In 1951, an internal staff report of the Kefauver Crime Committee identified Marcello as a heavy contributor to Russell Long's own political campaigns. One area in which Marcello's influence is particularly effective is the State Revenue Department. In this office, charged with collecting all state taxes, the mob boss seems able to control the hiring and placement of agents and can manipulate state auditing procedures almost at will. High-level revenue officials have admitted to life that the surest solution for a Louisiana businessman seeking a tax settlement is to approach the department through Carlos Marcello. As a result, the state is losing millions of dollars authoritative estimates put the figure at more than 100 million a year through fixes in the revenue department and by the atmosphere of administrative decay that such corruption fosters. An example of plain laxity was the nullification last year of a long-standing tax claim for $32 million against a large national corporation that operates in Louisiana. The claim was allowed to expire on the desk of Emmett Batson, the department attorney then in charge of prosecuting state income tax evasions. As of last summer, Louisiana had not prosecuted a single case of income tax evasion since 1942. For that matter, Batson himself had not even filed a return since 1965, nor had he declared at least 28,000 he collected in private fees beyond his state salary. 
When life investigators called this to the attention of Ashton Mouton, head of the Revenue Department, Mouton said he would take no action. I'm no Simon Legree, he said. There's lots of people who don't file, but we don't prosecute because it just puts them out of business. Batson has since been promoted to chief counsel of the department. His predecessor, John Levy, used to keep Carlos Marcello's tax files in a drawer marked Hold Action. The file has now been moved to another location, but here are a few items that were gleaned from its contents. Carlos Marcello and his brother Anthony owe the state $40,000 in personal taxes for the year ending 1962. There is no compilation at all of their taxes since that date. State tax collector Mouton allowed Marcello's brother Joe and another Marcello business partner, Roy Occupinti, to file back returns on the Desta Mortgage Company, but did not require them to pay the taxes. Occupinti is further delinquent in his personal 1963 income taxes and has not filed returns for 1965, 66 or 67. In 1965, a state investigator recommended prosecution of attorney Mike Maroon, operator of Marcello's Town and Country Motel in Shreveport. Instead, the file was closed on January 23, 1967, per instruction of Mr. Mouton. Joe Marcello, who runs the family's fashionable and highly profitable Elmwood Plantation restaurant outside New Orleans, has not filed a personal state return in eight years. Last January, Mouton called off a proposed investigation into tax irregularities and delinquencies at the restaurant. A large confidential file of income tax claims against Marcello's friend Marshall Brown, the Democratic committeeman, was set aside in 1967 and marked Special Handling. There was similar inaction on other assessments against Marcello family enterprises, including the CBM Corporation, La Rue 90, Garnet Land, Sapphire Land, Stevie Corporation, and a dozen more. A comment in file number 74338 illustrates the disillusionment of one investigator. I have my doubts this claim will be paid. Of course, these doubts are based on numerous other claims that I have had experience as belonging to Carlos Marcello, his associates or affiliated corporations. In January 1969, Division Director Millard Bird set machinery in motion to collect all back taxes owed by the Marcellos since 1960. Chief Counsel Levy set the files aside, and Byrd was prematurely retired two months later. Last year, the state of Louisiana made severe budget cuts in key state agencies, drastically affecting social services. School budgets were reduced. The average monthly welfare payment for a family of four shrank from $108 to $85. And New Orleans Charity Hospital, one of the largest hospitals in the country, is turning away patients because the funds are not available to hire enough nurses and technicians. Governor McIthan blamed the cuts on the legislature's refusal to raise taxes, and the legislature in turn blamed them on the administration's inefficiencies. Such argument ring particularly hollow in view of the Revenue Department's failure to collect its legal due. But the failure to pay taxes is by no means the outer limit of Carlos Marcello's effrontery or of the state's kowtowing. That distinction goes to the Churchill Farms caper, in which Marcello succeeded in forming his own taxing district in order to convert a large swamp he owns into solid, highly valuable urban real estate. To this end, the taxpayers of Louisiana will spend upward of $5 million, enabling Marcello to turn a profit of at least $59 million. The cost to Marcello, in drainage tax, is $264 a year. Here is how it has worked. In 1959, Marcello purchased a 6,000-acre tract called Churchill Farms, which is situated in Jefferson Parish, just a few miles to the southwest of New Orleans, for a figure in the neighborhood of $1 million. It was an unprepossessing place, consisting chiefly of a hunting lodge and several outbuildings, a caretaker's house, and a watery bird preserve. Diked and drained, according to experienced real estate appraisers, it would be worth easily $60 million. But such drainage is costly, and Marcello is not a man to throw his own money around. Instead, he set about to establish his own taxing entity. He convinced Jefferson Parish and state authorities that they should create a drainage district. This in effect made parish and state taxpayers pay for a share of the cost of drainage, but without getting any of the direct benefits. One of former Governor Davis's last official acts 
was the signing in 1964 of a contract authorizing the state and a regional flood control agency, the Lafourche Levy Board, to share $1 million in construction costs for a levy designed to guard the low-lying perimeter of Churchill Farms. No other land, just Churchill Farms. In addition, the contract called for a $500,000 payment half of Marcello's original purchase cost to Churchill Farms as compensation for use of the gangster's land to build the levy. Governor McKeithen authorized the issuance of the $500,000 check late in 1967, complaining that he was legally bound by his predecessor's commitment, even though that land drainage doesn't benefit anybody but Carlos Marcello. The levy was completed in 1968, and drainage was begun with the installation of huge pumps, which so far have cost the taxpayers nearly one and a half million dollars. Still another two million dollars in anticipated costs, to be financed by the sale of drainage district bonds, has been allocated to the Churchill Farms project. Better still for Marcello, when drainage is completed, there are plans to crisscross the property with paved streets and state highways, which will further enhance its value. This flow of public dollars into Churchill Farms did not just happen. In a 1968 federal tax hearing, Marcello and his representatives boasted how he had personally negotiated the land drainage contracts with the Levy Board and the Davis administration, and how he had caused the creation of the drainage district to impose taxes and pay for draining his swamp. Marcello predicted that a million-dollar pumping station would be installed and maintained at public expense. He also predicted that the land value of Churchill Farms would be further increased by highway construction. He based the latter forecast upon official assurances that a superhighway, the Dixie Freeway, would be routed through the Marcello Swamp. The pumping station has been built and the freeway has been so routed. On Jefferson Parish tax rolls, Marcello's 6,000 acres are listed as being worth only $22,000. His school taxes for the property are $594 a year, and the total of all tax payments by Churchill Farms for hospitals, schools, roads, drainage and sanitation is $2,030 a year. Even accepting the value of Churchill Farms at the $1 million he paid for it 11 years ago, Marcello should be paying close to five times that much in taxes at the going rate in the area. One final touch. The private white shell gravel road and bridge that now lead into Marcello's hunting lodge are maintained at parish expense. A parish road grader is parked much of the time within the Marcello compound. In contrast to Marcello's good fortune is the beggarly condition of the entire school system of Jefferson Parish. It faces imminent shutdown unless the state legislature authorizes borrowing against next year's tax revenues. The deficit incurred during 1968 and 1969, primarily because of unequal tax assessments in the parish, is three and a half million dollar or a little more than taxpayers already have paid for improvements on Marcello's swamp. In Governor McKeithen's behalf, it can be argued that Louisiana historically is not a state that encourages reform. In all the U.S., it was the only area to attain statehood with no previous experience in self-government. It was probably no coincidence that it was in Louisiana 95 years ago that a group of Sicilian mafiosi founded the first mafia family in the Western Hemisphere the same family that flourishes today under Marcello's stewardship. It must also be said in McKeithen's behalf that life found no evidence of personal involvement by the governor in any of Marcello's affairs. But there was no equivocation by Governor McKeithen when he voted to rid the state of Marcello's influence two and a half years ago. He made the pledge, launched the investigations, got himself re-elected, and that was about it. On the reception room floor in the governor's mansion in Baton Rouge, is a rug splendidly adorned with state emblems, scrolls, and mottos. The only imperfection in the rug is a blurring at each of the corners, where the word confidence is emblazoned on a bordure. The rug, it turns out, was locally designed but made Hong Kong. When the rug was delivered from the Orient, confidence was spelled exactly backward. It was weeks before anyone noticed. The irony can hardly be lost on the people of Louisiana a deal that drains both swamp and taxpayers. For sheer legal profit, nothing in Carlos Marcello's career matches the scheme by which he is now transforming Churchill Farms, a swampy 6000-acre tract he owns just outside New Orleans, into choice dryland real estate at taxpayers' expense. While the imperious mafia boss vacationed at a Gulf Coast motel, 
a million-dollar pumping station built with public money, below, began the job of draining his land, which until now had been good for casual fishing for mullet and catfish, and little else. Two problems for Marcello a federal charge and the naming of a successor. Though Carlos Marcello operates unimpeded by Louisiana authorities, he is being increasingly harassed from two other directions, the U.S. government and the mafia itself. As a result, Marcello faces an impending prison term and possibly even deportation. His troubles began in 1966 when the Justice Department launched a series of raids on gambling warehouses in Louisiana, Mississippi and Oklahoma that were under Marcello's protection. His rivals in the mob's national leadership, particularly Santo Traficante, the boss of Tampa cited the raids as evidence that Marcello was losing his grip and should be replaced. In September 1966, Marcello was summoned to defend himself at a secret mafia trial, the Little Appalachian meeting at La Stella Restaurant in Queens, New York. Police raided that meeting and arrested, among others, Marcello Traficante and the presiding judge, Cosa Nostra Commissioner Carlo Gambino. But Marcello had won his case before the raid took place. After his release by the New York police, he returned to New Orleans, exuberant with victory. At the airport he greeted a contingent of reporters and some FBI agents with the pronouncement, I am the boss here. To punctuate his words, Marcello swung a roundhouse right at the chin of FBI agent Patrick J. Collins and landed right back in trouble. Convicted of punching the agent, Marcello drew a two-year federal prison term. He is still free on appeal, but his pending absence gives Traficante the chance to renew his agitation to replace Marcello. This has brought to a head the question of succession. Rival heirs to the Louisiana Mafia Empire, Joe Marcello and Anthony Carollo, left the 1966 Little Appalachian meeting wearing handcuffs. Marcello himself had inherited the Louisiana fiefdom from Silvestro Carollo, a vicious superboss of the Huey Long era, and after, widely known as Silver Sam. Carollo was deported to Sicily in 1951, but in his heyday he was powerful enough to have once ordered Al Capone, arriving in New Orleans on a business visit from Chicago, to clear out of town on the same train that had brought him. Now Carollo's son Anthony, at New Orleans mafioso moneylender and restaurateur, wants to succeed Marcello as family boss and has Traficante's backing. Marcello wants his own younger brother, Joe, to take over from him if that finally becomes necessary. Last summer, Anthony Carollo and his sister, Mrs. Sarah Misakura, took off suddenly to visit their father in Sicily. Silver Sam, now seventy-four and seriously ailing, agreed to return to the U.S. to mediate the dispute over succession. In October, he showed up in Windsor, Ontario, just across the heavily trafficked border from Detroit, and shortly after the first of the year slipped back into New Orleans. His presence went undetected until February, when a TV newsman, Bill Elder, found him in the maximum care unit of a New Orleans hospital, suffering from a heart attack. Once he learned of it, the newly appointed U.S. attorney for New Orleans, Gerald Gallinghouse, brought the matter of Carollo's illegal re-entry before a federal grand jury, which summoned Carlos Marcello, among others, to testify. The grand jury indicted Silver Sam, who by then had recovered sufficiently to be moved from the hospital to his daughter's home. Gallinghouse has ordered an investigation into the Immigration Service's apparent laxity in the Carollo case. The investigation will also include another case in which immigration officials have been curiously inactive. Carlos Marcello himself was deported in 1961. A month later he slipped back into the country and has been living here ever since, unchallenged but actually an illegal resident. Until he was deported, Sam Carollo, photographed above in a 1938 narcotics investigation, was mafia boss of Louisiana. Now back in the U.S. illegally, he lives with his daughter who discourages intruders. This is the end of the 1970 Life magazine. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe to my channel.